outcompete China in the long term. And that means investing in ourselves at home to strengthen our own competitive hand. It means working with our partners and allies to make sure we have a united approach and a coordinated approach um, as it relates to engagement with China. Uh, we, of course, believe in intense competition. Uh, and it, we, we believe and understand intense competition is part of uh, that relationship. We also believe that uh, that uh, requires intense diplomacy. So this is a reflection of that. And if you go back to the President's phone call on September 9th, uh, where this was discussed, and obviously there was follow-up uh, engagement, uh, one of the dis part of the discussion was about the importance of that leader-to-leader -leader engagement, not because um, we are seeking and we're not specific deliverables or outcomes. Uh, more because this is about setting the terms, in our view, of uh, an effective competition where we're in a position to defend our values, which certainly will be part of the President's conversation uh, and those of our allies and partners, and also discuss uh, areas where we can work together. So I would see this, Andrea, as more of a uh, continuation of that intensive diplomacy, uh, given, uh, given that we believe intense competition requires that. Uh, and I wouldn't see this as an – I wouldn't set the expectation, I should say, that this is uh, intense tended to have, uh, you know, deliver major deliverables or outcomes. Yeah, so there were reports that President Xi could ask the President to attend the Olympics in February. What kind of signal would it send if the President were to attend the Olympics, given the concerns that have been raised about China's uh, actions toward Taiwan, its, you know, increased aggression <laughs> kind of flights there in that region? Is that, is that, would that be a problematic situation for the President? Well, I understand why, but we're getting a few steps ahead of where we are. I will also note for all of your planning purposes, and don't want to ruin your Sundays, but there will be a preview call uh, of the summit on Sunday that all of you will be invited to. So in terms of the uh, Olympics or any invitation, uh, I don't have anything for you on that at this point. Okay, just a quick one on the economy, on inflation. So one in four Americans, according to a new survey, have experienced some kind of loss of income as a result of higher prices. The President has expressed concern about this. I, I know that you are working on different fronts on to, to address this, but I mean, how urgent is it and how, you know, is there any sort of specific um, concern that this is, is going to affect not just political outcomes, but just the overall economy? Sure. Well, Andrea, first let me say that, you know, a lot of the talk about inflation, I'm not saying from you, but in general out there, has been, uh, it's become a political cudgel. And it shouldn't be. Uh, it's impacting, as you said, um, millions of Americans, uh, no matter their political party. Um, and that's certainly of concern to the President. Um, I would note that everyone from the Federal Reserve to Wall Street agree with our assessment that inflation is already expected to be subst to substantially decelerate next year. I know you're not talking about that, but that's an important component here. And economists across the board also agree that the President's economic agenda, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that he will sign on Monday, uh, and the Build Back Better uh, bill that we are working to uh, to move forward will not add to inflationary pressure and will ease inflationary pressure over the long term. But when we move past the economic jargon, which I realize is what you're asking me, um, and talk about the real impacts on people's lives, we're really talking about cost to people, right? And you talked about this on Wednesday. So it's cost of childcare, cost of housing, uh, you know, cost of gas, cost of household goods. Uh, that's how people are, are experiencing this on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is, of course, of concern uh, to the president. Our view is that the real risk here is in action. And the reason we uh, I wanted to do this slide today, when I love slides and graphics, so on my first day back, because we had to have one, but, um, but is because if we don't act on Build Back Better, what we're doing is we are, won't be able to cut child care costs in 2020. We know that is a huge impact on people's daily lives and American families. We won't be able to make preschool free for many families starting in 2022, saving many families $8,600. We won't be able to get ahead of skyrocketing housing costs. I mean, that's a part of this bill, too. Has a major investment in uh, building new housing uh, uh, affordable housing uh, units so that people can uh, can move into them and live in them and address the, the pending housing crisis. And we won't be able to save American Americans thousands of dollars by negotiating prescription drug prices. So our view is this this makes a strong case. This is a strong case for moving forward with this agenda because what we're really talking about is cost to American families, how it's impacting them, and that's something that if we don't act now, uh, we won't be able to address these things in the short term either.
ahead. Thanks so much, Jen, and welcome back. Uh, the president has picked Dr. Rob Califf as his pick for FDA commissioner. We've already seen Senator Joe Manchin come out in opposition against him, citing his significant ties to the pharmaceutical industry, as Senator Manchin put it. Is the White House confident that Dr. Califf can get confirmed as FDA commissioner? Uh, we are, uh, and I will say that uh, the president chose Dr. Califf, and this was in his statement, but let me reiterate some of this, because he's one of the most experienced clinical trialists in the country, has the experience and expertise to lead the Food and Drug Administration during a critical time in our nation's fight to put an end to the coronavirus pandemic. I'd also note that how we see this, or how this president sees this nomination, is a continuation of what he views as excellent work under the leadership of acting FDA Commissioner Dr. Janet Woodcock, who's led the agency through a challenging time uh, because of what's happening in the world and, of course, fighting the pandemic. I would note that um, four years ago, five years ago, sorry, my math is a little off there, um, he was confirmed uh, by a vote of 89 to 4. Um, one of those four uh, is the individual you mentioned, and every senator can vote for or against uh, members or people who are nominated. Uh, that's their role, but uh, we feel he's a qualified uh, person who has the exact experience for this moment. Thank you. And how many Republicans should we expect to see at the signing ceremony here on Monday? We will see. We have invited a broad group of